Hello, this is Joe Folkman, and welcome to the uh, podcast today. I'm here with my good friend and co-author, Jack Zanger. Jack, how are you? I'm well, thank you. And when you say here, we're maybe 30 miles apart, but we are together on online. Yeah. And, and we're here in spirit, but not in here. Absolutely. We are social distancing, and, and uh, the sun is shining today, which is wonderful. Uh, so... Jack, let's, let's go through the agenda and objectives here today. You bet. We have several objectives for the session uh, today. Uh, they are, we want to share some insights with you about how individuals can improve uh, on their trust. We want to certainly provide you with your individual results from the trust assessment. Uh, we're going to encourage you as a participant to identify one area in which you'd like to work and maybe improve uh, the way people view you and the trust they have in you. Uh, and finally, we ask the question, how does trust impact you? Uh, we believe that there's some interesting questions about uh, trust. Does trust between colleagues uh, truly influence business outcomes? Um, is trust important to a leader's success? Uh, and how effective are we at assessing the degree of trust that other people have toward us? And then finally, how do we build trust from other people? How can we elevate, escalate that level of trust that, uh, that people feel toward us? Now, we'd like to, to, to note that trust is an interesting quality because it does travel in two directions. Uh, one direction is uh, your belief about how other people perceive you. And so, you know, the, the definition here would be that trust is a, you know, a firm belief in the reliability, the truth, the ability, or the, the strength of someone, and that is being directed toward you. But we think it's also important to note that trust also goes in the other direction. How do, you, how do you feel toward others? What guides your behavior toward, toward other people? Uh, and here, you know, it's your willingness to be vulnerable based on your positive expectation of someone else's behavior to you. Uh, there were some authors who wrote a book a few years ago called The Trusted Leader, uh, a fellow named Robert Galford and his co-author, uh, Andrew Poe. And, they proposed a, an interesting formula, in, in our opinion. And that formula was that, that this thing we call trust has really some you know, very predictable components. One is, it's people's view of our reliability. Do we per perform consistently, uh, repeatedly, over and over? Um, so that, that reliability comes from our, our consistency and then there's also a quality of, of warmth and closeness. Uh, they use the term intimacy, and somehow sometimes people misinterpret that a little bit. But so it's that combination of reliability, consistency, intimacy. But it was interesting. They placed those three factors on top of a quality called self interest. To what degree do other people perceive you as operating in a selfish way, in your selfish interest? And if that's high, of course, then your level of trust goes down. If people perceive you operating with very little self-interest, then reliability and consistency and intimacy pretty carry the day, and that equals the level of trust that people have in us. So let's talk a little bit about how uh, the trust can impact uh, other people and you and, and, and the organization for that matter. Uh, trust has three outcomes. First is it makes life predictable. Um, when there's a lack of trust, you know, ugly things can happen, things that you don't expect can happen. But when you have trust, uh, life becomes more predictable. Uh, it creates a sense of community. 
If you trust your neighbors, you don't lock your doors, you can leave your tools out, they don't disappear. Uh, if you don't trust them, that, you know, you're not going to interact with them as much. And, and, and so that community is affected by trust. The third thing is it makes it easier for people to work together. Uh, and a really good example of that is a, a book by Stephen M. R. Covey. He wrote this book called The Speed of Trust. And when I first saw that title, Jack, I thought, trust and speed, those are different things. But as I read the book, uh, Stephen M. R. had this experience where there was two companies, he was in one of them, they merged with another company, and he talked about his experience in that merger. And what he found was, is that it took an enormous amount of time to make a decision. And there was a lot of arguing and, and, and it took so much time to move forward when there was a lack of trust. And we actually measured trust and then we measured something we called leadership speed. How fast a leader can work. The graph you're seeing is actually data from 84,000 leaders over that, but you can see that as trust goes up, a leader's speed goes up. <laughs> when trust is low, leaders just move at a, sales pace, a snail's pace. But when trust is high, you can see that that leader can move quickly, can get things done and can make things happen. And we found that leaders that were speedy were actually twice as effective as leaders that were slow. So really, I think the speed of trust really illustrates that trust and speed go well together. Uh, also, there's some interesting work by Paul Zak. He's a neuroeconomist, and he studied the difference in high trust and low trust organizations. What he found is employees in high trust organizations reported 40% less burnout, 66% more closeness with colleagues, 106% more energy, 70% more alignment with the company's purpose. And my favorite one, 17% higher compensation. <laughs> so you actually made more money in a high trust company. Uh, as you think about that, trust has this amazing impact on so many factors or elements in an organization. And I think uh, Paul Zach got it right in terms of the broad impact that trust can have. So as you think about trust in the workplace, the first uh, graph I want to show you is trust across the world. And we've gathered data across the world from 90,000 leaders. And here's kind of the trust scores. And you can see that there's a difference in the level of trust as we go from one country to another. What they've actually found is, is that they can actually measure the gross uh, GDP uh, uh, statistics for a country. And, and if you look at trust and GDP, they are incredibly highly correlated. That the countries with the highest level of trust have the uh, highest gross domestic product. And, and, and that's amazing because those two things are very correlated. So, in high trust countries, people do well. In low cost trust countries, people are frustrated. It's hard to make a deal. It's hard to get things done because of the lack of trust. So another thing that's interesting is we looked at our ability to measure trust or to assess our level of trust. And what we found is is that even though most people believe that they know whether they're trusted or not, they're actually pretty bad at it. They can only predict 8.8% .8 of the variance, uh, you know, in terms of predicting how well they're trusted. But any other rater, boss, manager, direct report, or others, predict 28%. So even though you think you know how trusted you are, uh, you may not. And in <laughs> fact, your predictions of trust may be wrong. And when we looked at the highest versus the lowest trusted uh, leaders, we saw these seven areas where there was huge differences, building relationships, honesty and integrity, collaboration, technical expertise, develops others, solves problems, and communicates powerfully. These all 
were tremendously affected when people underrated or overrated their level of trust. So Jack, talk about these powerful combinations. <laughs> well, <clears throat> one of the things that our research has kind of discovered is that there are some very powerful combinations between these qualities that people display. We looked at trust and we looked at communication and these two have a very, very interesting relationship. We looked at those people who were perceived as having a high level of trust, that is they were above the 75th percentile, uh, but they were not particularly uh, highly effective communicators. But what's the probability that a person who is highly trusted, uh, but not a very good communicator, would be in the top 10% of all the leaders in that, in that organization? And the answer was uh, very, a low number, the probability 2%. Now you flip that backwards you know, the other way and you say, now we have a person who is not perceived as being all that trusted by his or her colleagues, but they are really good communicators. Um, and so what's the chances of that person being in the top 10%? And interestingly, it's quite a bit higher. Uh, it is 17% probability that a person who's a great communicator, but not, not wonderfully well trusted, would be in the top 10% uh, of all leaders in their organization. And of course, if you add those two together, you, you all know better than to say what you just add those two. But really, it's very striking to see that when you do combine people who are in the top quartile on both being trusted and being communicators, good, good communicators, you see that they are now, there's an 80% probability that they will be one of your extraordinary leaders in your organization. So Jack, I remember when I was a kid and we were sitting down at the kitchen table and we were having fresh cantaloupe. I love fresh cantaloupe. But as we started to dig in, my dad looked at me and he says, pass the salt. And I looked at him and I said, this is cantaloupe. No, pass the salt. And, and he put salt on it. And I said, this is crazy. And he said, try it, put salt on cantaloupe. And I did. And it's amazing because it really enhances the flavor. Now, this may explain why I have high blood pressure. I don't know. <laughs> but I know it's not helping me. But you had a similar experience with it. Uh, we, we've talked about this before. What's fascinating about this example is that my father did exactly the same thing. He would put salt on watermelon and cantaloupe. And I guess chemically what it does is it, it pulls out all the, the juice, you know, and, and the, the salt kind of draws it out and, and makes, the, makes the taste much sweeter. Anyway, what you see here on this, on this slide is the relationship between trust and a number of other competencies. We've talked about the power of uh, the combination of communication and trust, but the same thing is true for building relationships, or it's also nearly the same thing true for solving problems and analyzing issues. And notice the very pronounced effect it has all the way down to the one that's at the very bottom, technical and professional expertise. And you would say, what relationship does trust have with being perceived as being good on you know, your technical or professional expertise? But as we've seen in this recent uh, episodes having to do with uh, the, the COVID virus, uh, when you trust somebody, they are perceived as having even more technical and professional competence. So we think there is a relationship uh, all the way down through virtually every other competence. So it enhances everything it has this tremendous effect. And when you think about leadership and you think about trust, this affects everything. So who's more trusted, managers or supervisors? And uh, top managers or supervisors? Well, we gathered the data. These are thousands of assessments from, uh, from leaders. And what we found is, is the top managers were at the 48th percentile, supervisors at the 56th. So, Supervisors are more trusted. Who's more trusted, men or women? Now, I, I ask people to vote on this. It, 
usually women get the vote, but hey, it's not true. <laughs> We're equally trusted uh, between men and women. Trusted older colleagues have wisdom, and and or younger colleagues, uh, colleagues. Surely it's it's the older colleagues, but unfortunately, it's not. They've too, told too many fibs <laughs> along the way. Who's more trusted? Well, as you look here, what you see is is the impact of trust on overall leadership effectiveness. And what this shows you is is the horizontal axis shows the levels of trust. And then the <clears throat> vertical axis shows you all the effective, the overall effectiveness of a leader. So if you have a low level of trust, you're really perceived as a very poor leader. If you have a high level of trust, you're at the 86th percentile. There's a tremendous influence on how you're perceived as a leader by how trusted you are. Another outcome that is affected is what we call discretionary effort, the percentage of employees who are willing to give extra effort. And this is, we call this discretionary effort. This is every employee when they come to work makes a decision, am I gonna give you the minimum amount of work possible, a little bit more than that? Am I gonna give you all my energy and effort? Well, the more trusted you are, the higher the percentage of employees that are willing to give extra effort and energy. And again, the most trusted leaders get 58% of their employees willing to give that extra effort. That's 3.5 times more discretionary effort. So team members are willing to work harder and do more when they trust their leader. So tell us about the trifecta. <laughs> so we've label this part of our discussion the, the trifecta of trust. So as Joe's mentioned, we have analyzed data uh, pertaining to maybe 87,000 plus leaders. And we identified <clears throat> three clusters of items that, that displayed themselves around this, this concept of trust. And these three elements that must be present for high trust to exist are, number one, building positive relationships. The second one is exercising ex expertise, displaying good judgment. And the third is demonstrating consistency. In that sense, our, our research is very consistent with the earlier research from uh, Galford and, and Drapeau, that there is this very powerful effect of, of consistency. So, Let's talk a little bit about building positive relationships. So again, what this is talking about is the extent to which a leader is able to create very strong, positive, warm relationships with other people and other groups. These, these are the people that stay in touch with the issues and the concerns being displayed by others. Uh, they are able to kind of balance getting good results with also a concern for the people with whom they work. And they're very effective at generating cooperation between other people. They're sensitive to conflict and, and they do their best to resolve the conflict that may occur between people within their work team. So you, you see this picture of then also giving honest feedback to people in, in a very constructive, helpful way. Uh, I, I was struck by this, this photo that was in the popular press recently. Uh, we, we live in a time of lots of you know, struggles and trials and here's this very touching picture of this young eight-year-old boy reaching out his hand. He he's, uh, hasn't known this other boy for at all. Uh, you know, they just, they've arrived at school at the same time, but he recognizes that this is a boy that has some challenges. Happens that the the boy with his head down is autistic. And here's this young man reaching his hand out just to provide comfort. That's what this building relationships is all about, uh, being sensitive to that. Uh, this, the second cluster <clears throat> of, of data had to do with the ability to exercise sound judgment, uh, utilizing your expertise and applying it to a challenging issue. So this describes the extent to which a leader is 
well-informed, knowledgeable, understands the technical aspects of the work, has a wide variety of experience, and therefore they are able to use very good judgment when making decisions. Other people really trust their ideas and opinions because it so clearly shows through that they are well-informed and knowledgeable and other people will seek after their opinions. We've certainly seen this displayed recently, again, in these briefings that have been conducted by the various technical experts uh, around our, our challenging coronavirus and, and COVID-19. COVID um, the, the amount of conviction that you have about messages that come from people who are expert and possess good judgment is really, you know, a, a very profound difference. And the, the outcome then for them is that they can anticipate and respond very quickly uh, to challenges and to problems. The third uh, element, this third uh, cluster of, of data was again, consistency. The extent to which leaders kind of walk their talk, they do what they say they will do, they serve as great examples and role models. Uh, they're very careful to honor the commitments they make. They're, they're careful to keep the promises. And if they've made a commitment, they do their best to follow through on that commitment. You know, in short, they just go above and beyond what needs to be done. Those are the three major components that we found were so predictive of this quality that we call trust, the trifecta. Yeah, and those three things. Uh, and when you think about trust, what we found is, is basically, if you could look at those three elements, positive relationships, expert, exercising expertise, and demonstrating consistency, those are the main factors. Those, those three factors would affect how much you're trusted. So we, we have a lot of data and because we have so much data, we can play with it. And so I did this little uh, a test where I looked at whether you were high or low on these three factors. So low was at the 40th percentile or lower and high was at the 60th percentile or higher. Now, again, those are not extremes, okay? So 40th, 60th, it's a, it's a bit below average or a bit above average. Uh, so what happened is, is we'd look at trust and then we'd look at how effective you were on those three elements. And it turns out if you're low, 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 your trust level was at the 20th percentile. Now, if you were uh, high on consistently, consistency, but low on the other two, it went to the 32nd percentile. And if you were high on judgment, but low at the other two, 36th percentile. But then if you were high on relationships <clears throat> and low on judgment, low on consistency, you popped up to the 52nd percentile. <laughs> now, in my mind, I thought, that the most powerful of these three elements would be consistency. Uh, it seems like if you're inconsistent, you're not, not trusted, but it turned out that it was relationships, that uh, that was the thing that affected trust the most. And the other two are important because what you see here as we go up the, 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 the chart here, low relationships now drops you down to the 48th, but then low on judgment drops you to the 59th. And then if you're high on all three, <clears throat> your average uh, ability to trust is at the 80th percentile. Now, <clears throat> once we did this analysis, what we discovered is, is that having these three elements in combination was really the key to trust. It seems like to be trusted, you need to have reasonable relationships. And again, we're not talking 80th percentile, we're talking 60th. <laughs> so reasonable relationships, reasonable judgment, and consistency if you do what you say you're gonna do. Those three things together build trust. 
And as you think about some of the things that have happened where people have violated one of those, and you can think of some examples of that, it's affected how much people trust them. So let's think about the perfect three. Being at the 60th percentile on positive relationships, good judgment, and consistency, 60th percentile or higher, gets you to the 80th percentile on trust. But at the 40th percentile or lower, it pops you into the 20th percentile. Those three elements seem to have a tremendous amount of influence on a person's ability to trust. So if you look at your self-assessment, let me show you what that gives us. It first gives you your preference towards those three different uh, issues, relationships, judgment, or consistency. And this just shows you which one you'd prefer to do, which one you do more often, which one you like to do, all right? And so the highest score means this is the thing you like the most. The lowest score means this is probably something you don't prefer a lot. <clears throat> now, typically there's a correlation between your preference and your effectiveness. The second part of the assessment actually gives you your effectiveness. We ask three items on each of those. These are items where we have data from over a million assessors and over 100,000 leaders. And so we're showing you this, the uh, ratings at the 40th percentile and the 60th percentile on all three of those issues. So this just shows you how effective you were or you rated yourself on these three issues. Now, sometimes our self ratings can be a little higher than others. Sometimes we tend to rate ourselves a little lower, but we do find they're directionally accurate. And so if you rated yourself low on one of these, that probably would indicate that there's a high probability that others would rate you low also. So think about that as you think about where you are on these three elements. And so let's talk about how you can become a high trusted leader. As Jack said at the beginning of this webinar, we'd like you to think about selecting one of these things to help you to be more trusted. So looking at your effectiveness score, the below average <coughs> score might be a good indication of which thing you might choose to work on your lowest effectiveness score. You almost also might, also might think about which of these three issues would really benefit you the most in your organization. Which of these things, if you improve them, would help you to be a better leader, would have more impact on your job, and which of these three things would your boss like you to be better at? So select one dimension for development that you rated low in effectiveness and <clears throat> that would positively impact your current job. So we're gonna talk to you a little bit about how you can improve these things. Now, intuitive logic on relationships, yeah, it just tells you, well, just be nicer. <laughs> Make more friends. Well, those are helpful a little bit, but what we're gonna show you is some research on companion behaviors that we found when you were good at these companion behaviors, they also helped you to be better at this specific competency. So Jack, tell us about these companion behaviors, first on building relationships. Right, we, we identified four elements that we thought really were important to, uh, to consider. And uh, I think again, it would be important to, to emphasize this number one, uh, cluster of building relationships, uh, if that is something that you saw that, that you either were not as effective as you would like to be, or that you didn't lean toward it as much, you, you might want to give strong consideration to what you could do to build even stronger relationships within your organization. And here's how to do it. Coaching and developing others. One thing that builds strong relationships is reaching, reaching out offering positive suggestions, positive ideas, uh, co coaching the people who report to you, 
and your boss and your colleagues. Uh, we've learned that there's a variety of ways that people inspire and motivate. One of our earlier webcasts was on the topic of inspires and motivates uh, in, in terms of how leaders do that. Uh, in a nutshell, what we presented was that this happens in a variety of ways. There's no one way that leaders are inspiring. Uh, they can be inspiring because of their strong interpersonal skills, because of their strong uh, attention to other people and making, making them realize their importance in the organization. They can be inspiring because they're, they're very technically expert. They can be inspiring because they're visionary. There's a variety of ways that they do that. But building relationships comes from being more inspiring. Uh, building relationships obviously relies a lot on being cooperative. Rather than competing with other people in the organization, uh, relationships are strengthened when people see you as wanting to collaborate and cooperate. I don't know about you, but we've all worked in organizations where there was more competition between the departments or divisions inside the company than there were than there was between a, your company and their, their strongest competitors. Uh, so building relationships really is very much driven by cooperation. And the last one I would like to just call your attention to is we have some very strong data about the power of asking for feedback. As, as the first item showed, being willing to give feedback and, and giving coaching ideas and suggestions to people is respected and appreciated. But the, the, the leader who asks others or suggestions about how he or she could be more effective, how they could function as a better boss. That is one of the most powerful things that you can do to build relationships within the organization. Some would argue that it's, you know, would have you be seen as weak. That's not the case at all. That, that does not happen. So Joe talking to us about, well, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I will carry on. Um, exercising expertise and good judgment. Uh, again, there are four elements to this. They are being a role model and kind of, again, doing what you say you would do. The second element that we found was very important was sharing information. Um, maybe you've worked in an organization a little bit like one that I worked in early in my career, where the, the order of the day was you tell other people what they need to know, not what they'd like to know, not what they would benefit from knowing, but what they absolutely had to know. Uh, that's a very different philosophy than voluntarily keeping other people really well informed around you. The third element is connecting your work and connecting the work of people with you to the, the vision and overall direction of the organization. This ability to kind of make that link so that people have a clear line of sight between what they are doing and the major objectives of the firm, that's a very powerful way to display your expertise and your good judgment. And finally, it's interesting that if you, if you deliberately sit down and you think about as you're embarking on some project, what could go wrong? What, what could possibly get in the way of the success of this project? It's amazing that people are relatively good at anticipating problems. It's just that many of us don't take the time to ever do that. We don't stop and say, huh, what could go wrong? What, what might happen? And how can I head that off at the pass? How can I make sure that that does not occur? And finally, the third uh, category of, of, of behaviors that really um, would help you become more effective at demonstrating consistency goes back to one that we mentioned a moment ago, collaboration. When you collaborate with the people with whom you work, offer your help, volunteer, provide information when you think they may be, may, may be missing something that's important to, to their work. Uh, that's a way you build consistency. 
obviously your willingness and ability to be con consistent in delivering on your commitments. You meet a deadline. The deliverable arrives when you said it would. The paper is done when you said it would be written. Uh, you are consistently uh, on time. And you do that at the same time to a very high standard. Part of being consistent is having very consistent quality. And so when you have a, another team or an individual who is erratic in what they deliver to you, that isn't consistency. Uh, consistency includes a, a high level of quality all the time. And there's a final element that that was uh, interesting as it emerged, and that was demonstrating consistency. And this may sound like it's a little bit of a contradiction. It's, it's getting continually better. There is this continuous improvement that signals not only is this individual willing to, to be, you know, very predictable, but they they are constantly wanting to make it better and, and gradually escalate or dramatically escalate the, the quality of service or product that, that they are delivering. So those are the kind of companion behaviors to each of these major uh, components of trust. Well, one of the things that we've uh, got for you is we've actually got a development guide and what the development guide does is it goes through all of the four elements for each of the three uh, uh, dimensions. And it gives you some specific actions you can take, some specific things you can do. Again, one of the things that we find that really helps people improve, if you say, well, I'm just going to be a better human. <laughs> I mean, well, that's a nice thing to want to do. but what does that mean? And you need to be specific and you need to have some actionable thing you're going to do. This gives you a list of very actionable things and we'd encourage you uh, to download this development guide. Uh, when you, uh, we, we're asking you for some feedback on the webinar and when you go and give us some feedback, you'll get the link to download this uh, particular uh, uh, document. Well, we studied 919 leaders. We looked at their ability to trust in the pre-test data. They're at the 31st percentile. In the post-test results, they got to the 67th percentile. We know that you can get better at trust. And we know that improving these three elements is the key to helping you improve your trust. What's amazing about trust is it is, uh, and Jack and I wrote an article about the salt and the sugar of leadership, and it was trust. It really affects everything, and we talked about that before. Uh, the best way to get an accurate assessment of your level of trust, we think, is using 360 feedback. Now, we'd love your feedback on this particular webinar. You can give us some feedback by going to the link bit.ly slash webcast APR5. And if you go to that link, you can uh, 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 give us some feedback and then download the link and download that, that development guide. We'd love to hear from you if you'd like to know more about this issue of trust. We found that this is a wonderful experience for senior groups. One of the things that Peter Drucker said about trust is leadership is an achievement of trust. And if you want leadership, you need trust. All right. Uh, on behalf of Joe and myself, uh, we recognize that uh, this has been a difficult month, maybe one of the most challenging months any of us can recall. And so as we come to this, uh, to the end of this series of webcasts, we want to, first of all, thank you for so many of you having uh, joined with us uh, and participated in, in all five of them. Uh, we've enjoyed talking about these five topics that are really interesting to us. Uh, the idea of speed, the idea of improving communications, the idea of being 
a bolder uh, leader. Uh, the, the ideas of how leaders can be more inspiring and motivating. And, and finally, today's session on trust. Uh, these are topics that really have caught our attention and we've spent some time in, in thinking about them and doing some research. And so, uh, Joe, what are, what are your thoughts as we kind of wind up this, uh, this series of uh, five topics? Well, we wanted this to be uh, inspiring, helpful, exciting, to give you something to think about besides uh, all the trauma that you're experiencing. Again, I think that if you look back on this experience and you say to yourself, gee, it was a tough experience, but I learned some things. I developed some skills. It kind of makes it worth it. So that was our hope in doing this, to provide this series of webinars to encourage you to learn and grow and develop as a leader. And again, our belief is better leaders, better results. So thank you so much for joining us. We've just enjoyed this experience. And, and if you have questions or, or want more information, please contact us. We'd love to chat. Thanks so much.